Okay, let me uh, begin with the introduction for Derek Dicker, um, who's Vice President and Business Unit Manager for the Performance Storage Unit of MicroSemi. Now, if you don't know about MicroSemi, um, they offer a, a comprehensive portfolio of uh, semiconductor and system solutions for different industries. They're using different industries, aerospace, defense, communications, data center, and industrial markets. The title of his talk is Accelerating NVMe Innovation for Emerging Applications. So at MicroSemi, his business unit's responsible for PCIe storage switches, NVMe SSD controllers, and NVRAM drives. Now, before he was at MicroSemi, he worked at PMC Sierra, and that company was acquired by MicroSemi in 2016. When he was at PMC Sierra, he was vice president of the Performance Solutions Group, and that group introduced a fast enterprise NVMe PCIe SSD controller and products in an NVRAM uh, drive portfolio products. Importantly, Derek headed marketing for PMC Sierra's enterprise storage division. Before that, he worked at Intel, where he was a technical assistant to executives in Intel's communications group, and I can tell you that's a very exacting job, one uh, that requires a mastery of detail and support for major speeches and events. His personal interests include marathon runs and a 10-plus mile run that's called the Tough Mudder. You can look it up on Google, I did. Um, the Tough Mudder Mud Run that raises money for the Wounded Warrior Project. This shows his energy, his athletic ability, and his community interests. He has a BS in computer science and engineering from UCLA, and he attended a very interesting program at the uh, Stanford Graduate School of Business called the Stanford Executive Program for Young Managers. So it's with great pleasure that I'm introducing Derek today. Derek? Thank you. Thanks, Jim. So first off, before I get started, I would like to thank everybody for coming today. I know this is the last day of, uh, of the show. Uh, I'd also like to issue a sincere thanks, and also I think we should all give a round of applause to the conference organizers who dealt with a, a very difficult situation the last few days. So if you could join me in thanking them. So it's been uh, a little bit past 18 months since PMC was acquired into MicroSemi. And I thought that maybe just to kick this off, I, I'd share a, a couple of questions that I get fairly regularly from, from individuals who, uh, who approach us to talk about our products. The first question always seems to be, hey, what's, what's it like within MicroSemi? And it's quickly followed by, and oh, by the way, who, who's MicroSemi again? Can you tell me a little bit about the company? So on the, on the first question, I always like to use an example. I walked into a meeting the first day with a sales team, and a sales guy walked up. And just to show you how direct the environment is, very focused environment, he said, Derek, I have to ask you, do your parents have a really good sense of humor? Wow. Well, why do you ask? He says, have you not seen your name? Your name is Derek Douglas Dicker. That's kind of crazy. And I thought about it, and I thought, you know, that's really funny. Quite a jokester. I said, but you know my boss's name is Isam Elishmawi, two E's. And even better, what I found is that the COO's name is Paul Pickle. I'm in really, really good company. Now on the, uh, on the second question of who is MicroSemi, it's actually one of the best kept secrets uh, in the semiconductor industry. The company was founded in 1959, and they were incorporated in 1960, and they started by building more discrete components for the aerospace and military areas. And you can see on the slide, we're up to 4,800 employees now. We did a billion six last fiscal year. This fiscal year, actually, we're gonna finish about 1.8 billion. We're in our final fiscal quarter. And if you take the midpoint of our guidance for this quarter and you add the three quarters before, we'll do $1.8 billion. If you wind the clock back just 10 years, we were a $300 million company. And the way that that was accomplished was through a very focused set of acquisitions, of serial acquisitions, and they were in the four domains that you see listed here. Aerospace and defense, communications, industrial medical, and then most recently, data center with a PMC acquisition. I thought I'd give you just a couple of examples of where our technology plays, because it'll give you a flavor of how at home we feel as part of this company. The innovation is incredible. This is a picture of an F-35 
Uh, in the first generation of this product, uh, we actually contributed about $15,000 worth of technology, and it was, it was historically in the discrete space. Today, with the latest generations, our COO, Paul Pickle, ended up disclosing that there's $50,000 worth of content in here. And the increase was actually due to the fact that we've added FPGA technology, clock technology, and power management technology. The other area that I love to talk about is in space and love to hear about more because I don't participate in it. If you've heard of, uh, if you've heard of the, well actually, let me just ask. Anybody know what this is? Satellite, Satellite? good question. It's the International Space Station. It's, I'll forgive you, it's okay, thank you. I appreciate you at least tried. So the, uh, the space station actually had a problem with fluorescent lighting that was located inside. And what the problem was that the lights were burning out and they needed to replace them. And they found an opportunity to innovate. We actually partnered with a lighting company that builds LED technology. And the reason why they wanted to do that was to be able to control the intensity and the color of the light to more accurately simulate sunset to sunrise periods of time. And what they found with the astronauts is that cognitive performance increased when they could align the lighting with the circadian rhythms of the body. Super exciting. We supply power modules into this environment for that lighting system. It's just another example of innovation. Everybody, if you could pull out your phone for one second and stare at it. There's time on that phone. You got a clock. That clock is actually synchronizing back into more than likely one of our sync servers in a carrier network, whichever carrier network you use. Microsemi actually provides the world's largest share of sync server technology that allows all of us to remain in precise time. And in fact, I heard a data point the other day. If you take some of our precise timing solutions and you connect with Marty McFly in the back to the future world and go all the way back to the dinosaur days and you leave that device there and you fast forward all the way to today, you would lose no more than a single second in time. That's how precise the solutions are that we deliver. In the communication space, we actually deliver FPGA technology that is quite secure. It's actually uh, tamper-proof. Uh, we deliver it with SEU immunity. This is single event upset immunity. That's actually core and native to the fact that the cells that we use, believe it or not, we're at the Flash Memory Summit, they're non-volatile cells that are located within these. So they're resistant to atomic particle disruption within the device. And as a result, we're able to work very closely with our customers to enable them to achieve five nines reliability when they install these FPGAs in the control plane of some of the world's largest routing solutions. Okay, one more question. Who can tell me what this is? It's not a satellite. It's a pill. Excellent. So within this device, we actually have provided an ASIC to a partner of ours that does a few things. Number one, it provides ultra low RF transmission capability. So a patient will ingest the pill have a box sitting next to them, and imagery will be actually delivered into this data recorder for post-processing to enable a doctor to deliver a diagnosis. It's actually phenomenal technology. Inside of this is an LED driver also, so that when it's ingested, it blows up light to record imagery. Now, the one question I guess I have for everybody is, who would be okay swallowing this pill and allowing it to circle? Thank you very much. <laughs> if I told you your alternative choice was a colonoscopy, which one would you pick? I'm with a pill. All right, the last one actually is uh, near and dear, not only to my heart, but pun intended, the heart of one of, uh, one of our colleagues. Uh, a friend of ours, David, in our PV group, recently suffered a stroke. Uh, as he came out of that stroke and they were diagnosing what happened, they identified an issue with his heart. He sent me this picture, and I embedded it in this presentation just as an example. He said, Derek, for as much as I kind of stare at the power matters tagline, now I actually believe that power matters. So the fact that we have ultra low power technology in these types of devices allows me to go almost 10 years without having to have this pacemaker removed. Super exciting stuff. Our, we try and define ourselves as putting technology to work for people, and I can't think of a better example than that. Okay, one last example to set up the storage portion of the discussion, that data center segment I talked about. I think most of us utilize some form of voice recognition today. Uh, the reason why I show this is, is within Microsemi, we've developed a product called Timberwolf. It's an audio processor. It sits on the circuit board that you see, but this is a development kit. And I thought this was a good example outside of our industry 
of somebody coming up with a set of APIs or standards to address a problem, a problem statement. And the problem statement was how do we make voice recognition accessible to many people? Out of that, an ecosystem was formed. And that ecosystem essentially is a series of different development kits that can be deployed to developers like ourselves in the world, and then software gets written on top of it to solve those problems. And that's what this is. This is essentially the AccuEdge development kit for Alexa voice services. This trend is actually one that was very similar to what stimulated our involvement in the SSD controller space in the NVMe world, as well as in the PCIe switch world. What we saw was a challenge associated with taking non-volatile media, putting it on a PCIe interface, and plugging it into a server, and having it work as efficiently as possible. Out of that came the foundation and formation of the NVMe standards, the bar on the left, the standards bar. We now have tens and tens of all of the who's who in the industry, all of us sitting in this room, contributing to the NVMe standards. So check, first one. The next piece is the build out of an ecosystem. Well, our contribution to that ecosystem was in the programmable controller space. We have a family of products that are called Flash Tech. And when we deliver those out into the world, customers innovate with firmware on top of them to build all kinds of different drives. And that's where the innovation starts. The Flash Tech products have now gone through three generations. This is our second generation. I'll get to the third in a minute. This particular product is codenamed Belmar. If you had heard it in the industry, it's a 16-channel device that we actually released to production a year ago. Uh, this device is being designed into a whole host of arrays. And we're very, very excited about the fact that we have hyperscale customers, OEM customers, all flash array customers, and even some kind of off the beaten path customers utilizing this base platform to go build solutions. In fact, we're at the point now where we've shipped our first million units of the products between last FMS and this FMS, and uh, the, the growth is going to only continue and accelerate over time. Now, I thought I'd show a couple of examples of, of products that have utilized this particular class of controllers. If you were here a couple of days ago, Eric Enderbrock and Curry Munts from Micron took this stage and presented out what's going on at Micron. And one of the announcements that they made was for the 9200 drive. Their predecessor, the 9100, had been shipping for quite some time. The 9200 was just announced this week, and it utilizes a flash tech controller in it. They deliver 8 terabytes and 11 terabytes in NAND on their highest end SKUs and upwards of 900,000 IOPS in that drive. It's a, a highly competitive drive. And I think most importantly to them, it's their delivery vehicle for their 32-layer 3D TLC NAND. I would encourage you to definitely check, check it out. The second keynote that actually took place that's relevant for this particular controller was related to Toshiba's. So Oshima-san, a very dear friend of ours, announced that uh, a select number of controller manufacturers were sampled QLC NAND from Toshiba. We ended up taking samples of QLC NAND, putting it on a Belmar-based platform, and were able to get the silicon up and running within a matter of weeks, with no changes to the silicon and purely making firmware modifications. Now, this can only happen if you have a programmable platform underlying your subsystem. And that's what Flash Tech represents. Now, one other one that I'd highlight is uh, the drive on the far right comes from a company called Radian. I highlight them because this is actually taking advantage of a programmable controller and taking on a, an application different than just an SSD. What they chose to do is actually first build an NVRAM, a non-volatile RAM drive that's PCIe connected. These drives are used in applications where you might want low latency access with DRAM-like performance you want to be able to put it on a PCIe interconnect for journaling purposes, and then also in the event of an abrupt shutdown, have the ability to vault from DRAM into NAND. This is using the same controller that's being used in the other SSD products that you see on this slide. In addition, what they've done is they've added innovation to support things like open channel or specifically their cooperative flash management technology. This is taking advantage of an alternative FTL method to be put into a system. The point here is that having a programmable platform allows the acceleration of innovation and will ultimately allow for broader and broader deployment of NVMe technology over time. Now, last year, 
we announced an expansion of our product line. So the products that I showed you a minute ago were all in the high end, super high performance, upwards of 750,000 to 1.2 million IOs per second. And what became clear to us was that a segment of the market was forming that was quite large in what we call the mainstream. This is a segment of the market with hundreds of thousands of IOPS. The capacity requirements might be slightly different. We're learning over time that they are quite large. But this particular product, the NVMe 2108, was actually introduced here at Flash Memory Summit. This device actually has all of the heart and soul of the original predecessor, Belmar. This one's codenamed Harding. The marketing name is the 2108. And this actually has all of the enterprise class features that people have come to rely upon in the Flash Tech brand. Dual port, it's the, the industry's only dual port mainstream PCIe SSD controller today. In addition to the fact that it supports all of the normal SRIS as well as LDPC technology that you come to expect out of a leading edge controller. Now this particular device also carries with it the benefit for customers who've designed in on the Belmar product the ability to leverage firmware into the device. So a customer who's built on Belmar has an advantage in being able to migrate to a, a 2108, a Harding, in order to deploy a lower power and a lower cost solution. Now we're pleased to announce this week, actually, that we took that device that we announced as introduced last year and put it into production. And one of the other things that I would also add is that with this particular device, we were originally specifying a performance, a throughput of 4K random reads at approximately 350,000 IOPS. Now the way our model works is we build a base platform, as I mentioned, and customers write firmware on top. And when they do that, that firmware can actually take the IOPS level and compress it. But what we're seeing right now, and demonstrations exist from partners of ours, is that people are able to get upwards of 550,000 IOPS out of this controller. In addition, we also see, I mentioned capacity as something that's fluctuating. We see that support for 16 terabytes of raw capacity in this particular controller is something that people are really focused on and interested in. Capacity is becoming a bigger and bigger play. We see designs being built on U.2 as well as M.2 for these particular products. Now, as the market expands and a large, large number of NVMe SSDs end up coming out into the market, something needs to be done to be able to manage these in systems. And this is going to shift our attention a little bit out of the SSD controller world into the infrastructure that sits behind these SSDs. We posited a theory a couple of years ago that said that just like what happened in SAS and SATA, when you inject solid state memory into a system that's not ready for it, you get this ripple effect where the performance needs to increase on all of the other components in the system. You almost create a bottleneck by delivering something that's got a million IOs per second of capability into a drive, into a drive slot if you don't have all of the other infrastructure behind it set to help out. And what we found was that there was also this gap of choice in the industry around the PCIe switch segment. If you're going to aggregate a bunch of NVMe SSDs, sometimes you'll plug those directly into a CPU, which makes good sense, but sometimes you'll want more than what's available from that CPU, or you'll want to manage those drives. And the way to do that is with a switch. The customer interest level that we found when we started talking about building a switch was phenomenal. And it led us to believe that we ought to start developing right away. And we did that not long after we started productizing our very first NVMe SSD controllers. And what we thought about was, if we're going to build this, why not follow this roadmap? We have standards in place already. There's enclosure services that exist. PCIe obviously exists. Let's give them a platform. Let's give the industry a platform upon which they can build and deliver differentiation on top of a switch to enable a family of JBODs, just like we do with SAS and SATA. And that's what we did. In 2015, we announced the very first family of storage switches in the industry. These are optimized switches with high lane counts, highly integrated, with the one thing that, that differentiated in the JBOD use case an enclosure services processor. Our history was in the SAS and SATA world in the enterprise storage division. And what we found was that 
Once customers had written firmware to manage an enclosure and a set of drives, what they also wanted to be able to do was the same thing, but do it in PCIe. That was our vision when we created these products. And as a result, we ended up seeing tremendous traction. The following year, we introduced a family of fan-out products for customers who wanted to actually manage the enclosure in a slightly different way or wanted to be able to take advantage of just interconnecting PCIe endpoints in a system, the PFX proved to be an ideal solution. Now, our next natural question is, okay, that's 15, that's 16. Are you doing anything in 17? I'll get there, I promise. What we found out was that there was still this, this nagging problem of how do we manage M.2, how do we manage enclosures, and how do we deal with hot plug? And this year in 2017 at, at Open Compute, we ended up partnering with our friends at Facebook, as well as Intel, and we held a, a brief uh, seminar exposing what we had learned by going through a project called Project Lightning. Project Lightning was one of the first hyperscale targeted NVMe JBODs. And we went through several iterations of getting that JBOD right, getting the design right and the firmware right in order to be able to create what essentially became a SaaS-like experience with a PCIe infrastructure. This is Project Lightning. Now this also tipped us off and said, you know what, if we really want to see innovation accelerate, part of how we can do that is by participating in the open source movement. Now at the bottom of this slide is what I just described, OCP and Lightning. The design has actually been donated and we've seen tremendous interest from around the world of customers wanting to take that design and modify it for their own use. So that's the first step. But what we also found was that there is quite a bit of interest in being enabled to accelerate development by us providing open source drivers. So at this point in time, we have actually open sourced a driver for the switch and an NTB driver, and they're all in the process of getting upstreamed. And this has been something that customers have come to us and said, hey, look, the fact that you do this work is accelerating our time to market. It's reducing our complexity in development. We really, really like this. Can we please do more? The last piece that I'll offer is that our devices seem to have struck a chord with some of our customers in terms of ease of use. We had one customer actually submit an email and then a testimonial online to say, look, I've used other products in the past. It's taken me months to get equivalent functionality up that it just took me a couple of weeks with you guys. Thank you very much. So I would encourage you, if you're considering a switch-based design where we can assist, please take a look at our switch tech products. Now this was also another example of a design from our friends at Celestica. Celestica is a partner who has a business model that's predicated upon calling where the industry's going, building platforms, making them customizable for their customers, and delivering them into the industry. This project, Nebula, was the world, one of the world's first, actually was the world's first, in, released into production, NVMe JBOD, featuring dual port, 24 dual port NVMe SSDs, all of the redundancy that you would expect from a storage system packaged into a single device, and it was built on SwitchTech. They didn't stop there. They actually released this product into production in May, and what they've done is they've carried it forward to add functionality. Now, one of the challenges that we see coming up as deployments of these large topologies occur is that PCIe doesn't necessarily lend itself to a scale-out model, where you want to have multiples of these JBODs distributed in multiple places. And as a result, what we see as a, as a demand from, from the industry is flexibility to add things like NVMe over fabrics. And last year, we talked about the fact that infrastructure was one of the biggest limitations of expanding the market. And Ethernet technology seems to, along with Fiber Channel, be a way through the standards bodies with NVMe over fabric to solve that problem. The Nebula with Fabric Connectivity, JBOF, that you see shown here, actually is designed so that it's flexible. You can select what the fabric interconnect is by selecting a card that gets qualified inside that system, so it gives customers choice but it also provides a mechanism upon which customers can go develop their applications. It goes back to this whole story of standards, ecosystem, and then innovation. Now, one of the other things that we've done from a, a software and firmware perspective working with the industry 
is we've started to create this notion of a, a fabric bunch of disks or an FBOD. So similar to the JBOD concept that we have in storage. We start with a PCIe JBOF. You just saw one. You add an RDMA NIC. This is for the fabric connectivity. We have a, an NVRAM product that we develop that's placed in the system, and that has an exposed bar of DRAM. And then lastly, you have a family of NVMe SSDs and a driver for peer-to-peer -peer capabilities. Now, in the old world, before you had to do this, you ended up having an RDMA NIC, if it wanted to talk to an SSD, have to go up through the CPU into DRAM and then right back down into the NVMe SSD. In the new world, with peer-to-peer, -peer, you have the ability for the RDMA NIC with this software and with this capability to leverage the DRAM that's placed in the NVRAM and to skip having to go up to the CPU and the DRAM and write into the NVMe SSD. Now the value that this brings is actually efficiency, but it frees up cycles on the CPU also. So you no longer have to be using the CPU for these regular interrupts. You can actually allocate that CPU to things where you can get more value out of the system. So this is code also that's available on GitHub. If you have interest, let us know, and we'll happy, be happy to point you to it. We also have a demo. We'll be putting this demo up in a video online, since we weren't able to show it here, unfortunately. But this demo actually featured our partners at Mellanox, working with Celestica to provide the JBODs. We actually had Memblaze uh, NVMe SSDs inside the system performing these exact transactions in a live environment. And we're finding increased interest in these types of innovations where we can put out software and allow customers to download it, leverage the open source nature of it, and build these high performance systems. Now, I mentioned scale out. If you wanted to have multiples of these types of JBODs in a system, the next question is, all right, what about scale up? And I also mentioned that we had one more thing that we were working on. We've just disclosed the existence of a new product called PAX. And PAX is an advanced fabric switch. It's the latest member of the Switch Tech switches. And it's essentially designed to enable PCIe fabrics. And with all of the move to disaggregated infrastructure, we found that there was this desire, in addition to the fabric attached systems, to have a scale up system. What we support is multi-host IO sharing. And we take NVMe SSDs that are enabled with SRIOV and we set up a solution that looks a lot like this, where you have a pair of switches, a series of hosts at the top, and the ability to actually share a drive sitting downstream below the switch by two different hosts. This is a capability that's enabled on a, a footprint compatible device, the PAX device. So if you design in with PSX or with PFX, you can use your same design and leverage a PAX, a PAX device, in order to service these types of applications. Customers are beginning to do some very, very interesting things with this topology and technology. Now, I think this kind of takes me to my final slide. Last year, we tried to make a case that said that the world around NVMe and NVMe infrastructure is sitting at an inflection point. And one of my absolute favorites is uh, Dr. Andy Grove. He created this notion of a strategic inflection point where he essentially said it's a time in the life of the business when the fundamentals are about to change. I think it's absolutely clear we've passed that inflection point. We're actually at the stage of growth and the innovation that I described to you today and that we can all as a collective body work on is gonna only cause us to bend that curve even harder and up and to the right. Thank you very much for your time today.